Fuzzy Mud by Lewis Sacker. Chapter 5, Tuesday, November 2nd, 3.18 p.m. By the time Tamea made it to the other side of the fence, Marshall had already disappeared through the trees. She picked up her backpack and hurried after him, slipping her arms through the straps as she ran. Ducking under a low branch, she spotted him climbing over a small mound of boulders. Wait up, she called. Again, he disappeared from view. Her knee banged against one of the boulders as she scrambled over the mound. He was waiting for her on the other side, hands on hips and annoyed look on his face. What's the point in taking a shortcut if I have to keep stopping and waiting for you to come poking along? I'm not poking, Tamea insisted. Well, hurry up then, said Marshall. He turned and started off again. She stuck close to him as they followed a path that zigzagged through the trees. It had rained the night before and damp leaves stuck to Tamea's sneakers. Leaves continued to fall around them, one here, one there, gently drifting downward. They must have missed a zig or a zag somewhere because after a while it became clear to Tamea that they were no longer on any kind of path. She had to fight her way through tangled branches and then step over a thick patch of thorny bushes. You think we should turn back, she, she suggested. Marshall answered with a short, blunt, no. Tamea pretended to be brave. Every little noise made her heart stop, made her heart leap. She got down on her hands and knees and crawled under a very low branch. Is this the shortcut, she asked as she straightened back up. Marshall didn't answer. He just kept moving forward. Her sock was torn and her skirt was splotched with dirt. She didn't know how she'd explain that to her mother. One thing she couldn't do was lie. She would never lie to her mother. Her parents had divorced when she'd been in first grade. They had been living in an apartment in Philadelphia at the time. It was a different apartment from the one her dad lived in now. Even back then, everyone always talked about how smart she was which had surprised her because it wasn't something she gave much thought. She was who she was, and that was all. She'd been given an aptitude test, and then she and her mother had moved to Heathcliff so she could attend Woodridge Academy. One thing she wasn't smart about was her parents. She couldn't figure out why they'd separated and why they didn't just get back together. After the divorce, her mother seemed very sad for a long time. On Tamea's last visit to her father, he said to her, You know, I still love your mother very much. I always will. But when she repeated those words to her mother and suggested that maybe they should all live together again, her mother got all sad again. That will never happen, she told Tamea. Even now, as Tamea was scared to death, that she and Marshall might be lost in the woods forever, she couldn't help but think that maybe, if she did get lost, her mom and dad would come looking for her together. She was imagining what it would be like when they found her, and how they'd all hug each other when a small animal darted right in front of her. She stopped. What was that? she asked Marshall. What was what? You didn't see it? She wondered if it could have been a fox. Some kind of animal practically ran over my foot. So? So nothing, she muttered. She didn't know why he was being so mean. They came to an old dead tree laying on its side. Much of its bark had rotted away. Marshall climbed up on it and looked around. Hmm, he muttered. He looked back the way they had just come. Are we lost? Tamea asked. No, Marshall insisted. I just need to get my bearings. You said you knew a shortcut. I do, he answered. I just have to find the exact place where it starts. Once I find the starting point, we'll be home in a snap. He snapped his fingers as if that proved it. Tamea waited. She heard something crackle behind her, but when she turned around, there was nothing there. Marshall hopped down from the tree trunk. This way, he declared, as if he knew exactly where he was going. Tamea scooted around the tree and followed. She had no choice. They made their way down the side of a hill until they came to a ravine, then followed the ravine upward. Tamea's backpack, backpack, backpack felt heavier with every step. She kept thinking she heard something or someone behind her, but when she looked back, there was never anyone there. Marshall continued to walk quickly. She constantly had to run to catch up, but soon would lag behind again. Each time it became harder to catch up. 
Out of breath, she watched him disappear around a curve in the hillside. She shifted the weight of her backpack, gathered what strength she had left, and started to run after him. Something grabbed her from behind. She felt her sweater being pulled up against her neck, choking her. She twisted free, then screamed as she fell to the ground. Rolling over, she looked up, but there was nobody. No deranged hermit, no blood-stained beard, just a tree limb with pointy branches. Marshall came hurrying back down to her. Are you okay? She felt more embarrassed than anything else. I just fell, she said. She realized her sweater must have gotten caught on the branch. That was all. Marshall continued to look down at her. I'm really sorry, Tamea, he said finally. He seemed really worried. I saw a rocky ledge up the hill, he told her. You wait here. I'm going to climb up to it. I should be able to get a good view from up there. Don't leave me, she pleaded. I won't, I promise. He took off his backpack and set it next to her. I'll be right back. She watched him head back up the hill and disappear again around the curve. She took off her backpack and set it next to his. She was too worn out to follow. She took off her sweater to see how badly it had been damaged. It was worse than she thought. There was a hole almost as big as her fist just above the right shoulder. She definitely didn't know how she'd explain that to her mother. Even though she had been given a full scholarship to Woodridge, her mother still had to pay for the school uniform. The sweater had cost $93. It wasn't fair. She would never admit it to her friends, but she loved the school uniform. Monica, Hope, and Summer thought it made them look like dorks. They could go on and on about what they would wear on the last Friday of each month when they got to wear real clothes, but Tamea always felt proud to put on her sweater with the words virtue and valor written in gold and the year 1924. It made her feel important, like she was part of history. As she was thinking about this, she found herself staring at a large puddle of some kind of fuzz-covered mud. Her mind barely registered it, registered it at first, but the more she gazed at the odd-looking mud, the more it drew her attention. The mud was dark and tar-like, just above the surface, almost as if it were suspended in mid-air. There was a fuzzy, yellowish-brown scum. Something else struck her as strange about the fuzzy mud, although it took her a moment to realize what it was. There were no leaves on top of the mud. Leaves had fallen everywhere else. They completely surrounded the mud puddle, right up to its edges, but for some reason no leaves had landed on top of it. She looked back up the hill. There was still no sign of Marshall. Her gaze returned to the fuzzy mud. It was possible, she thought, that the leaves had sunk down into the mud, but the mud seemed too thick for a leaf to fall through it. She wondered if that fuzzy scum somehow swept the leaves off to the side. A noise crackled from below. She turned toward the sound and then heard it again. Something was moving through the trees. She rose to one knee, ready to run, then caught a glimpse of someone wearing a blue sweater and khaki pants. It was the boy's school uniform. She stood and waved her arms. Hey! she shouted. The figure stopped. Over here, she called. As he came toward her, she recognized him as the boy who had sat next to her in the lunchroom. He was the one who had stood on the bench and said a wolf had bit a hole in his pant leg. She wasn't sure, but she thought his name might have been Chad. She looked back up the hill and shouted, Marshall! Marshall! We're saved! Chapter 6. The Ergy. The following is another excerpt from the secret inquiry into Sunray Farm. Senator Wright. As I understand it, you invented Bioline while you were still in college? Jonathan Fitzman. Well, not exactly. I got a C- minus on the paper I wrote about my idea for the Ergie, so then I dropped out, of my, uh, dropped out of college and continued to work on it in my parents' garage. They weren't too thrilled about that, if you know what I mean. Senator Wright. Mr. Fitzman, would you please try not to swing your arms so much as you answer our questions? Jonathan Fitzman. Was I swinging my arms? Sorry, I have trouble sitting still too long. 
I think better when I'm moving. Senator Wright, so what exactly is this ergy of yours? Jonathan Fitzman, ha <laughs> ha, that's just what I call the little guy. It's short for ergonym. It's a single-celled, high-energy microorganism, very intense, totally awesome. I got a tattoo of one on my arm. If you want to see what it looks like, it's an exact replica. Senator Foote, I can't see anything. Senator March, me neither. Jonathan Fitzman, well, like I said, it's an exact replica. <laughs> it's the smallest tattoo in the world. <laughs> you need an electron microscope to see it. Senator Wright, and there are more than a million of these ergies in every gallon of bioline? Jonathan Fitzman, a million? Try a trillion or a quadrillion or I don't know. What comes after that, a gazillion? Senator Wright, Try to control your arms, Mr. Fitzman, Jonathan Fitzman. Sorry, I don't even have a chair at my desk in my office. I have to keep moving, Senator Foote. So you are no longer working out of your parents' garage, Jonathan Fitzman. No, I've got this incredible laboratory now. My biology professor might not have thought much about the ergy, but some other folks did, some very rich ones, Senator Foote. How much does it cost Sunray Farm to produce one gallon of bioline? Jonathan Fitzman. I'm not the business guy. I'm the, what do you call it, the guy who thinks up, thinks it all up and figures out how to do it. But I'd say the first gallon costs us somewhere around $500 million. Senator Wright, $500 million? And what about the second gallon? Jonathan Fitzman. Uh, about 19 cents.